God's judgment will not be determined by what you do at CrossFit, but by what you do with the cross. Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for the drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to.
bear your cross as you wait for the crowd tell the world of the treasure you found So here we go, May 1st, new month, new message series, and we are going to do something that Depot Church has never done before. I've never done before. We're going to be talking about love, all right? Well, we talk about love before, but also we're, we're talking about love and marriage and babies and families and relationships. All of that we'll, we're going to cover this month. This morning, we're going to start with a little introduction uh, to that. Here's where this background for this came from. Over the last, uh, I think, how many years I've been in ministry now? Uh, was it 13? 13 years I've been in ministry. Um, I've done more premarital counseling and marital counseling over the last three months, <laughs> I promise you, than I've done in the last 13 years of ministry, okay? And so I'm thinking God is trying to teach me something. Maybe about my own marriage, maybe about marriage and relationships in general. But not just that, it would be, it would be not good for me to just take it and, well, as my own, but also to, to share it with you guys, what I'm learning, uh, what God is teaching me about relationships and marriage and family and all that, and, and to kind of discuss that on Sundays. Is, is that okay if we do that? I hope so, because I've already planned and prepared <laughs> for that. So that's what we're going to be doing this month. It's going to be fun, and uh, we'll have fun with it. But um, I know what you're thinking. Let, let's, let's take out of the way a, a couple things here. First, I know what you're thinking. What is this young buck going to teach me about relationships, right? Marriage and family. What's this young buck got to say? I've been married longer than he's been alive, <laughs> you know? What is he going to teach me? Well, I'm glad you feel that way, Okay. Because I'm actually not the one that's going to be teaching you. We're going to be looking at God's Word, the Bible. God is going to be using me to, to say some things and, and talk to you guys. So, so that's good. In no way have I mastered, I have a master's degree, but in no way, ask my wife, have I mastered love, marriage, and child rearing. Okay, I promise you, I'm, I, I have not mastered that. I learn something new every day about all of it. And so we're all going to be talking about these things and, and looking at God's Word. Uh, I've, I actually learn from mistakes. Do you, are y'all like that? I learn from mistakes that I make. I learn from mistakes that I make, and it helps me to, to adapt and change. The second thing you might be thinking is that you are not, you're outside of the realm of this, all right? Maybe uh, uh, you have no plans in the immediate future for love, marriage, and baby carriage, or maybe you're past that, okay? You, and you have, you're, you're done, you're, you're finished maybe, okay? That's okay too, um, that's fine. I want, uh, don't check out, all right? Don't check out of this and, and don't not come back because uh, you, you, you're, you're done because, listen, here, here's the thing. You probably know people or have friends and family that are in the midst of uh, the beginnings of, of love and, and of marriage and of child rearing and having families, right? You probably know people, and so um, we, 
as young people, families, uh, maybe if you're beyond this, we need your wise counsel, okay? We need your wise counsel. And so you go to the God, God's Word with us this month, and that way when you interact with a, a, a person who is starting out on this journey, you can provide wide, wise counsel uh, to them and help them along. Um, so, I think all of us has had, have had this, this old rhyme, right? You've heard it before. This old rhyme chanted at us in school at some point. I don't know if they still do it today, but when I was a kid, they did it. Chanted at you. You could walk down the hallway and just say hello to a girl or, or just say hi or hey, how you doing or whatever. And then suddenly the boys would, would here they go, uh, Dusty, I'm using my wife and I, Dusty and Jennifer sitting in a tree. What? First of all, what's up with sitting in a tree? <laughs> I'd like to be enlightened on that. If that's a romantic gesture, then I got plenty of trees in the backyard that I can be romantic, okay? Uh, I don't know about the sitting in the tree thing. And then it goes, Dusty and Jennifer sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G, just in case you can't spell kissing for more emphasis, I guess. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes... Is it Jennifer pushing a baby? I've always heard it like Dusty in a baby carriage. Uh, <laughs> Jennifer pushing a baby carriage. But here's the th cool thing, though. They did get the sequence of events, the proper sequence of events going on there. Love, marriage, and baby carriage. So that's a good thing. This morning, I want you to go ahead and turn your Bibles to Genesis 2. All right? Genesis 2. We're going to go to the beginning. All right? Let's start at the beginning, not just of time, which that's where we're going, but also of human relationships. And this love affair that began here between man and woman. Genesis 2, we're going to look at 18 through uh, 25. Genesis 2, 18 through 25. <clears throat> Are you there? Are you ready to take notes? Are you ready to read and get involved? Say amen if you are. Okay, good. Here we go. Genesis 2, 18 through 25. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals, all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. Now listen, um, not just making up names for things, but that also shows that God has put him in a position of leadership over those things, that he is able to name them, okay? He gave names to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals, but still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God calls the man to fall into a deep sleep. While the man slept, the Lord God took out one of man's ribs and closed up the opening. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. Check out man's response here. All right, check out, here's man's response. At last, <laughs> the man exclaimed, this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman. Woman. Because she was taken from man. Listen, there's a lesson here for us men uh, that we should protect and take care of our women, right? Because they are a part of us, okay? This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. We are definitely going to look back at this in a, in a couple weeks as we continue uh, to look at uh, marriage. We're definitely going to look back at this, um, this scripture again, uh, most definitely. But this morning I want to use it as an introduction to the message series, to this topic, as well as an introduction to human relationships, specifically between a man and a woman, because we're, here we are, we're seeing the beginning of, of, of human relationships. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Father God, I thank you for creation. I thank you for creating us, Lord. And Father, I thank you for creating us for each other. So God, this morning as we continue to get into your word, I pray that you would unpack some things about relationships. Father, may we learn today, may we grow, may we grow closer to you, but also grow closer to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. 
So listen, as it turns out, and this is totally coincidental, um, every point in my message this morning is also the title of a song. Okay, so we're going to have a little fun today. All right, hit the first... uh... (laughs) One is the loneliest number. Anybody remember? Three dog night. Three dog night. Yes. One is the loneliest number. We need to understand right off the bat that God loves us so much That not only does He want us to have a relationship with Him, correct? But God loves us so much that He created us to be in a relationship with each other. Alright? And specifically here we're talking about uh, a man and a woman in a relationship. If if you've ever watched a movie about a person who is alone, okay, for example, Cast Away, starring Forrest Gump, alright? I know it's not Forrest Gump, it's, it's Tom Hanks, but anytime I see him in something, I think Forrest Gump. Okay, Castaway. You've seen Castaway, right? Deserted Island. He's Castaway. All right? Or more recently, have you seen what I call Space Castaway, which is The Martian with Matt Damon? Same concept, except stuck on, the, on Mars instead of on a deserted island. If you've seen anything like this, you know that loneliness usually leads to insanity, right? Loneliness usually leads to insanity. In Castaway, if you remember... In Castaway, Tom Hanks takes a, a volleyball, right? Volleyball, Wilson. That's his name, Wilson. He names the volleyball, and that becomes his best friend as he's stuck on this island. In fact, when he loses Wilson trying to get off the island through the water, he breaks down. It's like a death in the family for him. Many of you have seen this post on Facebook. Have you seen this? Yeah. It says, would you live in a secluded, this secluded cabin, cabin, alone for a month for $100,000? Many of us would be like, hey, yes, I would do it. I would do it. Yeah. Or maybe we daydream about the opportunity to be alone, to get away, to be alone. Other of us hate being alone, right? Other of us, mostly ladies, can't go to the bathroom without someone accompanying us. Listen, Genesis 1, if you remember, if you go back to Genesis 1, the creation wasn't very good until man was created, if you remember that. Everything was good, and then man was created, and he looked at it and he said, very good. Everything was very good. Here in Genesis 2, God says, goes back and says, it is not good. Listen. It is not good for man to be alone. Now, I think to myself, did God see something missing in in what was very good creation? I mean, Adam, the first man, was created, but did God see that something wasn't right? Was it, this is what I think in my mind, and I question, did God see that man was lonely? What did God see here? But I want you to know, as I'm thinking about this, Let me make this clear. Woman, the creation of woman, was not an addendum to a plan uh, gone wrong. You hear me? Woman was always within God's plan for man. Always within God's plan, the creation of woman was. In His infinite wisdom, right men? Shake your heads. Please do. In His infinite wisdom, He created woman out of man and thus the origins of relationships, marriage and family, begins. You may have heard of Reggie Joyner. I've used him before. Uh, He's one of the leading voices in family ministry in in our country. Uh, He said this, When it comes to entities that God has created specifically to make disciples and accomplish His mission, there is the church, The family, and nothing else. You hear that? When it comes to entities that God has created specifically to make disciples and accomplish His mission, there's the church, the family, and nothing else. So before there was the church, the institute we call the church, there was also 
there was the family. And here we are seeing the very beginnings of that. Think about this for a second. The family, a unique human relationships. Discipleship begins there. Begins with the confines, within the confines of your home. That's where discipleship and missions begin, right? As a youth and children's pastor, I used to always tell the parents, I was like, look, you guys are the cake. And when you bring them to church, we, we try to put the icing on it. Okay? So discipleship and missions begins within your home. And so in Genesis 2, we are seeing the creation of the first of those two entities, the family. If, if you're just a husband and wife here, just a husband and wife, Maybe your kids have moved out. Maybe you've not had kids yet, kids yet. I want you to know that just because it's one and two, you, just y'all two, you are family. You hear me? When you got married, uh, when you found each other, y'all became family. Family doesn't just begin when you have children. Family begins when you say, I do. You and your spouse are now family. Most important thing I want you to know is you were not meant to do life alone. You hear me? We were not created or meant to do life alone. You might think you're a loner. You might like to go to that cabin, right? And take that hundred grand and be there for a month. Or maybe you up the ante. Go to that cabin for a year and take a million or whatever it is. But you weren't meant to do life alone. You weren't created to be alone. I've heard a, a proud loner say, all I need is God. Yes, we, we, that is, um, in a lot of instances, all we need. But I reply to that loner, well, why do you have so many cats? <laughs> uh, it's terrible. I'm sorry. Listen, we were created... For God, of course, and to be in relationship with Him. But we are also created to be in relationship with others, with other people, and specifically our new family as we get married and go forward. Truth is, even when I personally, maybe you're like this, even when I think and I act like I want to be left alone, like, I just, you know, if, if I act that way, the truth is I'm actually crying out for what? Attention. Maybe you're the same way. Maybe you have kids that way. Even when I act like I want to be alone, really, I don't want to be alone. I'm, I'm looking for attention. I'm looking for um, a partner, some help. Do you remember the greatest commandment? We've talked about it here during Love Month. Do you remember the greatest commandment? Love God. Love others. you remember that? Love God. Love others. Now, if he wanted us to be alone, to be loners, there would be no need to love others. There would be no reason to follow the greatest commandment, but that's not the case. We were created for relationship. Quite frankly, if, we're, if, if we are secluding ourselves, if we are secluding ourselves, then we are breaking one of the greatest, command, the greatest commandments. We're breaking one of the greatest commandments. So, First point, one is the loneliest number, okay? Second point, Shannon. Alright, second point is help. Help. And continue our themes. Help by the... Oh, I thought it was the monkeys. The Beatles. Uh, help by the Beatles. So being alone and loneliness wasn't the only thing God saw as a need, but also, if you remember in our scripture, help. We need help. God said, I will make a helper that is just right for him. God, see, God could see that man needed help. And guys, today, God can see that man needs help. Amen? Gentlemen, please say amen if you're with I mean, If you're with... Say amen. We need help. I will admit it. And here's God's cure for loneliness. The creation of a helper. Help. I need so much help that uh, all of our parents live on our combine at our house. 
We all, they're all there. That's how much help I need. We need help. We need relationships. We need that. So during, um, during premarital counseling, I have uh, the couple that I'm counseling. They write down a list of opposites, right? For example, one says, I'm a night owl, versus the other one says, uh, I'm an early riser. That's an, that's an opposite. And when we do that, the list is supposed to show if there will be anything that might cause any kind of conflict because of opposites. Make sense? It's to show us, is there any conflict going to happen because of the opposites in the relationship? But here's the thing that I find interesting about this during premarital counseling. I find interesting is that um, it turns out to be that those opposites that people list in their counseling are actually a help. A help rather than a problem. For example, one might be very organized and be on top of it and be on the ball, whereas the other might have the idea of, well, it, it's just going to happen. It'll happen, you know, it'll happen, right? So what happens is, the amazing thing when doing counseling, you see this, where, where the inefficiency is in one partner, guess what? The other partner is efficient. Okay, So it doesn't cause a rub a lot of times, but it, what it actually does is they, they're, they're filling each other in efficiencies, with efficiencies. This is not coincidental. This is not coincidental. This is, this is God-ordained. Men, I don't know if you know this, but men and women are opposites. In general, speaking, men and women are opposites, physically and emotionally in many, many ways but not to drive them apart. God did not ordain this and create this to drive them apart, did he? No, actually, to be a help of each other, to each other. So that same thing that drives a woman crazy about a man is the very same thing that she has created to help him in. You hear me? That same thing that drives a man crazy about a woman is the very same thing that he has created to help her in. Are you with me? We were created to help. Woman was created... Woman, I'm, that's, I'm sorry, that ladies. Is that better? Women. Women were created to meet man's deficiency. See, man's purpose for earth was... To multiply and take dominion over the earth. Without woman, this wouldn't happen. Woman was created to complete man, just like Jerry Maguire said on the elevator. Right? You complete me. You complete me. So, here's the thing. A lot of times, advice is given, and I'm, I'm not giving advice right now. I'm just saying a lot of times advice is given that you're to seek out a person that is just like you, right? The, you look for someone who is just like you. But don't let that always be the case because if you want to better yourself, you can seek someone who fills in the gaps of your deficiency, right? Where you're inefficient, this person can be efficient. They say that about staffing too when it comes to a, a church or any kind of staffing if you're in business and you, you're, you're a leader in business is that you, you don't go out and find someone who is just like you and can do what you do. But you find someone like Jesse, right, who can fill up my deficiencies, and, and Megan, who's not in here now, but who fills up a lot of my <laughs> inefficiencies, okay? Same with our relationships, husband and wife, man and woman. After all, when we get married, we come together. It's not you and I anymore. It's us, right? We're becoming one anyway. Put the pieces together. Are you ready for the last point, point three? That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> Shameless, Garth Brooks, anybody? Anybody a Garth Brooks fan? Shameless. Yeah, shameless by Garth Brooks. 
Our scripture, if you remember, says that man and woman felt no shame when they were naked. What is today when you think when I think about it, the first like form of shame is focused around our bodies, right? Too fat, too skinny, too short, too tall, too hairy, in my case, gray hairy, and too bald. All right? Shame. Here's what shame is. Shame is produced by the consciousness of the evil in something. That's shame. The, ma- the relationship between man and woman was created pre-fall, prior to evil's entry into the world. And later on in Genesis 3, though, you're going to read where it says, when evil enters the world through the fall of man, the very first emotion, the very first thing that they have is, is shame. In particular, shame of their nakedness. Look at, um, first, before you do that, we feel shame because the human perspective is initially based upon appearance, right? It's based upon appearance. You've heard it been said in a relationship, it says, like, I was initially attracted to the person because of their physical appearance, because that was the, the attraction process based off their appearance. But listen, we also hear that what kept that person in that relationship was what? That they got to know the heart of the person. You you would not want to stay in a relationship where it was only a, a physical attraction and there was nothing else. That would be not healthy, not good. So listen what 1 Samuel 16, 7 says. You've heard this before. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. Listen, that's a sermon in itself. The Lord doesn't see the things the way we see them. People judge by outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. Looks at the heart. Your mom and dad have told you this. Right? It's what's on the inside that counts. They've told you this. They were right. Our God and Creator looks past the flesh, looks past the physical body, and directly into our hearts. Listen, this is important. God's judgment will not be determined by what you do at CrossFit. Because if it was, I'm in a lot of trouble. God's judgment will not be determined by what you do at CrossFit, but by what you do with the cross. You hear that? John Piper says there are two types of shame. Misplaced, the kind we ought not have, and well-placed, the kind we ought to have. An example of misplaced shame would be this body shame that we kind of touched on. It's when you're ashamed of something that doesn't dishonor God. Now, sometimes your physical can do that. But He created us, uh, our bodies, and and they do not dishonor Him. Well-placed shame, well-placed shame, comes when we are involved in something that dishonors God. Things we do, lifestyles, sinful lifestyles that we're involved in, where we should, there are things we do that we should feel, feel ashamed of. However, God doesn't want for us to feel misplaced shame, especially when it comes to relationship with Him, right? And just as there can be no shame in our relationship with God, there can be no shame in our relationship with the helper that God created for us. One of the big, biggest reasons when you meet with couples One of the biggest reasons for conflict in marriage is dishonesty. Number one, A1, dishonesty. What causes dishonesty most of the time? Shame. Shame in a behavior, shame in an action, shame in an activity is what causes us to be dishonest in our relationships. Listen, there's no research necessary to know this. Relationships built on honesty will last longer than relationships built on lies. Don't need any kind of research to to back that, do we? 
That's just commonsensical truth. Abraham Lincoln said, no man has a good enough memory to be a successful liar. The best thing that we can do in our relationships with people, in particular our relationships with husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, if we want to start out right and not have shame and avoid it, is to strengthen, or first to be honest, to be truthful, and, say, and most importantly, is to strengthen our walk with Jesus. Because if our heart is what God looks at, then it's probably what we need to be doing the most work on. Right? If God is looking at our hearts, then maybe we should neglect the crossfit a little bit and work more on our hearts. What if we worked as much, if not or should be more, on our relationship, our hearts, as we did on our physical appearance? Our look. Listen, Jesse's going to come up and start playing, but this is just an introductory of what we're going to be getting into over the next few weeks. As we look at love, marriage, and baby carriage, family. But before we even go there and get to that, before we even get there, we need to understand these things we talked about today. Okay? We've got, we got to understand this, that we were not created to be alone, correct? We were created to be in relationship with God, in relationship with others. That's the commandment. Love God, love others. We were created to, to be a help, right? We were created with efficiencies that can fill others' deficiencies, inefficiencies. We are created to help. And then we talked about the last thing, that we should live shamelessly before our God because He knows our heart. And hopefully, out of honesty, live shamelessly before our partner because we want to build our relationships off trust. Will you stand with me and let's pray together. Father God, human relationships are important to you. Particularly the institution you created, which we call marriage and family. It's very important to you. You did not create us to be alone. So Father, I pray this morning that in each of our hearts that we would seek to have better relationships husband, wife, father, son, father, daughter, in all our relationships, that we would seek to have God-glorifying relationships because the family is an institution you care about. The family is a place of discipleship and missions. And so, Father God, this morning as we all are seeking you right now in this time of commitment. I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Father, that first you would be our priority. Our relationship with you. And that second, God, our family. So Lord, as hearts are directed towards you right now, Father, Pray that you would speak to us. That you would hear what we'd have to say. Or that we would hear what you had to say. And that we would take that. Apply it to our lives. And be changed from this point on. Father God, we love you so much. We pray this in, in Jesus' name.